Hey, this is Tim back for Wrong Sports, and if you have seen any of my other videos, you might know that I like to go over a lot of unfortunate events that have happened in college athletics. Uh, plus, I ended 2020 going over some of the worst teams throughout the first 120 years of college football, as well as covering some of the worst teams of Division III football. So, because I did all of that negativity to end 2020, I wanted to start 2021 with some positivity. So, over the next few videos, I'll be covering some of the best historical college football teams. I will also be covering some of the best historical teams that don't get a lot of recognition as well. That'll be happening in my next video. But first, like most lists that I have done, I am going to put these teams in chronological order as it is very hard to rank teams from over 100 years ago. Plus another note is there wasn't really a consensus national champion. Uh, in most years, there were upwards of 10 selectors for a national champion. So I will be referencing some of these polls as I go on. But first, make sure you like this video, make sure you share this video, and of course, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Also, leave me a comment, just tell me anything, uh, whether you like the video, whether you didn't like the video, something I should be going over in the future because that really helps a lot with the channel. But first, let's start with the oldest team on my list. This is the 1883 Yale Bulldogs, and this was the 14th year since college football started with Princeton and Rutgers in 1869, and most rules of college football were still being figured out. One of those rules was the scoring rules, as most games ended with not a lot of scoring, and most teams getting to double digits was very rare. But with the 1883 season, touchdowns were worth four points, point after touchdowns were worth two points, two-point safeties, plus you got five points for a field goal. So that would really explode the scoring this year. Plus, along with these scoring rules, there were 45-minute halves by this season, and having three downs to make five yards instead of four downs to make 10 yards like there is now. Now, the down and distance rule also helped the scoring because most teams would slowly move the ball down the field, resulting uh, with games with final scores looking like baseball scores. 1883 was also the first year for this new scoring, and Yale scored a lot. Yale also scored 90 points three times this season, and it scored an average of 73 points through their first seven games against other Eastern powers like Columbia and Rutgers. Uh, they would also play Michigan, who were one of the few Midwestern powers to travel to Yale, and Yale was one of the few Eastern powers to actually play a non-Eastern team, so this was pretty big at the time. Uh, Yale would beat Michigan, actually they would thrash them, 64 to nothing. And Yale's final stretch of games were the toughest as they traveled to the polo grounds in New York City for a pair of games around Thanksgiving. First, Yale played Princeton, who they played eight times out of Yale's first 11 seasons, and they had a record of 2-2-4, two, two, and four, so they were looking to break that record here. Princeton proved to still be their toughest test as Yale just barely got out of there with a win 6-0. And finally, Yale played Harvard in their last game of the season, which would become the biggest game in the East by the end of this decade. In the turn of the century, but Yale made easy work of the 8-1 Crimson as they won 23-2, and they pretty much won the national championship uh, because Princeton and Harvard were the two best teams that year, and Yale would be the only team this year to have played nine games and won them all, and they beat Princeton and Harvard, like I mentioned, who this year were a combined 15-3, so that is why they are my oldest best team on this list. Up next is another Yale team because this is another historic Yale team from the first 50 years of college football. First off, this team was coached by the father of American football, the man who helped create or helped shape pretty much all of the rules and the way that modern football is played in Walter Camp. Yeah, Camp was a Yale grad who actually played on the football team from 1876 until 1881, where they had a record of 19-1-6. and and after he graduated, he went to medical school. He also worked in the New Haven Clock Company, and he came back to Yale to be their first official coach this season. Since camp graduated, Yale were still the monsters to beat in the East, as from 1882 to 1888, Yale only lost one time, and they tied it twice, all to Princeton. Yale was also starting some of the most famous early legends of the game this season as they dressed future Hall of Fame coaches Amos Alonzo Stagg, who I'll be mentioning in a little bit on this list, plus George Washington Woodruff, who would coach at Penn, Carlisle, and Illinois, and Pudge Huffelfinger, 
that's a fun name to say. He was actually the first person to be paid to play football in 1892, so yeah, he needs to be mentioned. Also, along with these future legends, they had a great backfield that would score 126 touchdowns and average 53 points a game. Their offense was amazing, and their defense was even better as they didn't give up any points, including in their final game, which was the de facto national championship game, where they played Princeton, who were also 11-0. So yeah, this was the like biggest game of the time. Uh, and yeah, Yale won 10 to nothing. Walter Camp at Yale. From 1882 to 1892, he went 68-2. and two. He would leave after 1892 to uh, coach at a couple of other places, but he would continue to be a volunteer coach at Yale throughout the early 1900s. Okay, so you heard me talk about Princeton a little bit. Here is the oldest playing school tied with Princeton in the school that for the first 20 years of intercollegiate football were chasing Yale for the top spot in the East. This is the 1889 Princeton Tigers. Princeton were a top team, but they couldn't beat Yale throughout the first 20 years of college football as they only beat them twice in their previous 13 games. This year, Princeton were coming into the season with their best as they would have five All-Americans by season end. And that was significant as this was the first year an All-American team was written and Princeton had the most players on that list. Princeton boasted a great backfield with their fullback Snake Ames, who from 1886 to 1889 scored 62 touchdowns, though this is unofficial. And along with Ames, they were also led by a quarterback with a great name, Edgar Allan Poe. Yes, he was related to the great poet, but at Princeton, Poe was known as the great quarterback Edgar Allan Poe. Princeton, with their great team, had a tough schedule as they played powerhouse Penn and destroyed them 72-4. Penn would end the season 7-6. They would trudge on through the rest of the East as they played Columbia and beat them 71 to nothing. And then on November 16th, they traveled to Harvard to play the 9-0 Crimson. The great Poe at QB and Ames ran through the Harvard defense and they beat him 41 to 15. But their biggest test came when Princeton ended the season facing 16 and 0 Yale. Yeah, that's right. Yale played 16 games this season. Uh, a lot of them were against the same team two times, even upwards of three times. Yale was still great. They still had most of the same players I mentioned and Camp was still at coach at this time. Princeton would battle Yale all game and shut them out 10-0, which gave Princeton their first undefeated season since 1885 and the first season they beat Yale and Harvard in the same season. We are not in the 1900s yet because I'm going to be hanging out with another Ivy League team. You'll be hearing a lot of Ivy League teams in this countdown, but this is the 1897 Penn Quakers. You heard me mention a moment ago about the 6-0 Yale team in the 1880s. Well, here is another team with a bloated schedule, but this team went undefeated through it, though. Penn this season were led by George Woodruff, who you heard about when I mentioned that really good Yale team. Well, he learned everything he knew from camp and he brought it to Penn as this team played a lot of games and scored a lot of points. Woodruff came to Penn in 1892 and has gone 67 and five through his first five seasons, including a 34 game winning streak from 1894 until 1896. So coming into the season, they were really good. Plus this season, they expected to be good again as they brought back their tackle and back John Outland, who you will know because the trophy is named after him. And also sharing the line with Outland was a guy with a great name, Truxton Hare, who was a freshman this season and would go on to be named an All-American this season and all four seasons he played at Penn, and he was the first player to do that. Penn had a long 15-game schedule this season, but only played two on the road, and that made it rather easy work for them in their first nine games, as they gave up only four points in those nine games. In their 10th game, though, they made up for a huge loss the previous season as they beat Lafayette 46 to nothing, and Lafayette were undefeated and named national champions by a few writers the previous season, so beating them this year was pretty huge. They continued this run by beating Brown and Cornell, and even beat Carlisle, who I will be mentioning soon, but they faced their toughest test November 20th against Harvard. Harvard was undefeated, but did tie Yale the previous week, so if Penn could beat Harvard for the fourth year in a row, this would give them the national title. And they would do just that. But Harvard wouldn't make it easy, as Harvard was one of only three teams this season to score on Penn, but Penn still managed to outscore them, winning 15-6. Penn this year would be 15-0, scoring an average of 31 points and only giving up one point per game. 
And I'm kicking off the 1900s with an amazing team. This is the 1901 Harvard Crimson. This team had an astounding nine All-Americans, which even for Harvard at this time was nuts because for more perspective, there were only 18 All-American spots, so they had half the team. Uh, anyway, this team was coached by former player William Reed, who played on Harvard in 1898 in 1899. He was chosen to coach due to an old Harvard tradition where they would vote on a former player from the previous season to coach the next team. Reed was chosen to take over and Harvard, like I mentioned, was amazing as they had a talented roster as two tackles and two guards from this team made the All-Americans. That means they rarely gave up any points as they had nine shutouts this season, only surrendering 24 points. Plus, they would also play a great schedule versus Army, who were an elite team at this time. They were 5-1-2 and two this year. Plus, they closed out their season with three fantastic games that started on November 9th as they traveled to Philly to play the 9-2 Penn team. They beat them 33-6. Then they traveled back home to play undefeated Dartmouth on November 16th and gave them their first loss 27-12. Finally, they capped off their season at home versus the undefeated Yale. They were 11-0-1 at this time, and they were coming off an undefeated season in 1900, and they were looking to repeat again. Well, Harvard didn't give Yale any chance in this game as they shut them out 22 to nothing to cap off the undefeated season and a national title. 1901 might have had a great team in the East, but 1901 was also the rise of Michigan in the Midwest. In 1901, Michigan had some big changes as Fielding Yost took the helm and they went 11-0, never giving up a point and scoring over 50 points a game. Plus, they also won the first Rose Bowl. So yeah, that was a big change for a lot of people in the East. Now, many people would think to put that team as the best team, but the team next year in 1902 might be the best team of this early run for you and I'll tell you why. But first, before I get to the team, I gotta tell you about some fun lore that follows Coach Yost. First, him being the first ever person to transfer schools mid-season as he transferred from West Virginia to Lafayette, who were named national champions by some selectors that season he played. He did that because he was on West Virginia and they lost twice to Lafayette and he didn't wanna lose a third time. So he played in Lafayette and he ended up getting a national championship in the deal. Plus he also had some trickery. He dressed up as a tackle in one game while he was coaching Ohio Wesleyan, and coincidentally, it was against Michigan. But even with those strange moments in his career, he was always a winner as he had winning records while he coached at Ohio Wesleyan and Nebraska and Kansas and Stanford, so he continued that when he came to Michigan. And if you thought 1901 they were dominant, they were even more dominant in 1902 because this year they had an average of 58 and a half points per game, which was the highest of their point a minute teams which was from 1901 to 1905. Plus, they also scored 100 points twice against Michigan State and Iowa, who were pretty good teams at the time. So these weren't against like some schlub teams. These were against some big name teams. Point totals were a little different as touchdowns were only worth five points and field goals were worth the same, but Michigan never liked kicking as they scored 106 points and only kicked four successful field goals this season. So that really shows how dominant their offense was. So right there, Michigan's offense was better in 1902 than they were in 1901, but their defense wasn't really as they actually gave up some points this year in 12 points, so an average of one points per game, which is kind of tough to beat the zero points per game the previous year. Michigan pretty much dominated everyone in the Western Conference this year, which was basically the Big Ten at the time with the addition of Chicago. And Michigan shut out Chicago this season too, 21 to nothing, who ended their season 11 and 1. So they gave Chicago their first and only lost. Plus they beat Minnesota 23 to 6, who ended their season 9 2 and 1. But another big reason why I put the 1902 Michigan team on this list was because they beat Ohio State by their biggest margin ever, as they beat them 86 to nothing. So yeah, if you're a Michigan fan, that's a good thing to see. Michigan also had the distinction this year of having players on the All-American list and was one of the few Western schools to have a player on the list. Michigan wasn't invited to a bowl game this year after their beatdown of Stanford the previous year, but they were still 11-0 and even more dominant this year. So all the selectors picked Michigan to win the national title, and that is why I'm calling this 1902 team the best of all the Yost Point Amina teams.
So this is a perfect team to follow up the Point a Minute Michigan teams, as this was the team that ended the Michigan Point a Minute teams. This is the 1905 Chicago Maroons, and Chicago was one of the biggest rivals for Michigan in the late 1800s, and it really got heated up as the 20th century started. Along with that, Chicago also boasted a Hall of Famer and legendary coach in Amos Alonzo Stagg, who I mentioned before with those early Yale teams, but Stagg is also a really super interesting person who I kind of want to do a video on, but I might have to uh, wait in the future for that. But here's a fun fact. Just before Stagg went off to Chicago in 1892, he stayed around in Springfield, Massachusetts, as he was still an instructor at the Springfield YMCA at the time. That was significant because that was where the game of basketball was invented and he was actually invited to play in the first ever game in front of fans. There were 200 fans in attendance and he actually scored the only basket for the losing side in that game. But anyway, Amos Alonzo Stagg would become Chicago's coach in 1892 and build Chicago into a Western Conference power as they won the conference with a 12-0-2 record in 1899. And they were also a team who would play anyone because they had multiple seasons of 16 games or more. The 1905 season was going to be a little break from that as they were only going to have 11 games with 7 against the Western Conference or the Big Ten at the time. Chicago was known for their defense and not really having a flashy offense not like Michigan's at least, but it got the job done, as Chicago would easily beat some of their out-of-conference opponents with ease and all by shutouts. Then they would start conference play on October 7th with a 42-0 shutout of Iowa. They would then give up their first points of the year in a 16-5 win versus Indiana, and would finally close out with a weird score of a 4-0 win over Wisconsin. After these tough games, though, they proceeded to shut out more conference opponents as they beat Northwestern, Purdue, and Illinois by a combined score of 95 to nothing. They were 10-0 going into their last game at home versus the undefeated Michigan team who were coming into this game with a 56-game unbeaten streak and hardly anyone scoring on them as they also scored an average of 40 points per game. Well, this game was the opposite of a shootout because they went scoreless through the first 50 minutes until a blunder on a punt and a safety by Chicago giving them the 2-0 lead and they eventually held on to win two to nothing and gave Michigan their first loss in over four years. No matter what the score was, this was a huge win for Chicago and Stagg, as it was the first time he beat Michigan since 1900, which was also the last time that Michigan lost a game. And Stagg was an all-timer because he coached at Chicago until 1932. He coached there for 40 years until age 70, when he would then head out west to coach Pacific until his mid-80s when they asked him to retire. So yeah, Stagg was just a beast. Next up is another great team that I love to mention because of basically one player, and he is one of the most legendary players of all time. Plus, they also had a very legendary coach. This school is the 1911 Carlisle Indians, and the player was Jim Thorpe. Yeah, if you don't know Jim Thorpe, he was pretty much the first ever All-American greatest athlete of all time. Thorpe was a native of the Sac and Fox tribe. He was also a student at Carlisle, which was an Indian boarding school in Pennsylvania. Thorpe wasn't a sports star immediately, but once the football coach, Glenn Pop Warner, and yeah, that's where the Pop Warner Football Leagues comes from, got a glimpse of him, the whole offense was about Thorpe, and that included the kicking game. I'll get back to Thorpe in just a second. I want to get to Pop Warner, though, who was already 10 years in of being the Carlisle coach at this time. Uh, he coached at Georgia and Cornell before this, and he turned Carlisle into a team that was tough, even though they had some deficiencies. One deficiency being that Carlisle players were often smaller than most players, but they were so much quicker. So Warner created an offense that would outpace other teams. The offense and the team in general sometimes caused teams like Harvard, Princeton, and even Army some troubles at this time, but unfortunately Carlisle just couldn't beat any of those teams any year. This year, however, the team clicked and Thorpe showed why he was America's best athlete. With Warner running the show and Thorpe pretty much doing everything on the field, they easily won their first four games all at home, scoring over 30 points and giving up less than two points per game. After they got through their first four games, which was a tune-up for their next eight games, which were all on the road, taking them all over the Northeast to play a whole bunch of great Eastern powers. They would play their first important game, Game 6 versus Pittsburgh, who were coming off a 9-0 19-10 season, and who were 2-0 coming into this game. This game 
game was tough through the first quarter, but then Thorpe would score the first TD and convert the extra point and give Carlisle a 6-0 lead at half. After half, Thorpe continued his magic as he would scamper for another touchdown and then recover his own onside kick. Carlisle wouldn't allow Pitt to score and they won the game 17 to nothing. Carlisle would then shut out Lafayette and Penn, making them 8-0 when they traveled to play Harvard. Harvard was 25-1-2 over their last three seasons, but coming off a brutal loss the previous week to Princeton by a score of 8-6, Harvard wasn't looking to lose back-to-back -back games. Unfortunately for Harvard, Thorpe was looking to continue his winning ways, and also, he didn't want to lose to Harvard again, as he would score all of the points for Carlisle, as well as pick up his own onside kick again to give them a shocking 18-15 win. The winning didn't last as they suffered a one-point loss the next week to Syracuse, but Carlisle didn't lose again, ending their season 11-1. Thorpe had 899 rushing yards, which was really hard to certify as many games didn't have stat takers. So, I mean, 899 yards is amazing, but he probably had way more than that. Carlisle will continue to upset teams next year, too, as they won 12-1-1 in 1912, beating Pittsburgh again, as well as Syracuse, and also beating Army with future president Eisenhower on the Army team. Thorpe led the nation in scoring that season with 29 touchdowns, there is so much to say about Jim Thorpe, not only in college, but in the Olympics and baseball. So we'll just leave it at that by saying the 1911 team was awesome. So let's just move on. And we got two more teams left, and this team is not unknown now, but before World War I, no one outside of Indiana had heard of or really cared about Notre Dame and their football team. Now, it wasn't because Notre Dame was bad, because they were actually really great over their previous four seasons. From 1909 to 1912, they went 24-1-3, but it was against mid-level teams in the Midwest. They also did occasionally play Wisconsin, Northwestern, and Michigan, which by 1913 they had a losing record against, and they were looking to step it up this year. Notre Dame did just that, as they tried to schedule an Ivy team like a Yale or a Harvard, which did eventually happen in 1914 versus Yale. But this season, Notre Dame still ended up scheduling some great teams in Texas, who were 7-1 the previous season, Penn State, who were riding a 17-game unbeaten streak this season, and Army, who were on top of the pyramid of college football at that time, with Harvard and Yale and Penn and etc. So Notre Dame getting a game against them was huge. So going into the 1913 season, they would have a tougher schedule and also have a new coach in Jesse Harper, who played on the 1905 Chicago team I mentioned earlier and was coming in with a good record from coaching other Great Lakes teams. Finally, on this team, they also had some legendary figures, as their quarterback was Gus Doreas, and one of his receivers was the famous Newt Rockney. And this pair was not only great in the running game, but they also threw through the air, as Notre Dame was one of the few teams to use the forward pass, which only started getting used about seven years before this. Their offense had no issues in their first three games, as they were all at home, but then they went on the road to end their season, and it was against all of those bigger name teams I mentioned earlier. Their first test was their biggest test as they traveled to New York to play Army, and Notre Dame was given no shot to win, and most thought this game was a tune-up for Army before they would play their tougher teams out east. Notre Dame in this game wasn't a pushover, and they dazzled Army with their passing offense, as Doreas connected with Rockney in stride, which was rarely if ever seen before, and Notre Dame would score the upset 35-13. Some in the East thought this was a huge misprint, but it wasn't, and this win made Notre Dame. The Irish would continue this run as they would beat Penn State the next week 14-7, and they traveled all the way to Texas the week after that to beat the Longhorns 30-7 and end their season 7-0. Even though they didn't play a ton of games this season, this was the first real season where Notre Dame was taken serious, and after this, more teams from all over the country would want to play Notre Dame and create the Notre Dame legacy that they now have had for the last 110 years or so. The final team I'm going to cover is what was called then the greatest team the South ever produced. This is the 1917 Georgia Tech team, and that team already makes them good, but it was even better as this team was coached by the man himself, John Heisman. Heisman arrived at Georgia Tech in 1904, and after that he would proceed to create the best and highest scoring team in the South. They would run all over teams and score at will as 100-point games wasn't a shock, and they even had the record for scoring as they scored 222 points 
in a shutout as they beat down Cumberland in 1916, and that is a famous game. But coming into this season, Georgia Tech wanted to show everyone that they were the best team in the country as they would play their usual Southern schedule with the addition of the Penn Quakers, who agreed to play them in Georgia October 6th, which was pretty huge for Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech had no problems with their first two games as they won by a combined score of 58 to nothing. But then the Penn game would come up. Penn would come to town off of a Rose Bowl the previous season, and they were also unbeaten this year. It didn't matter to Georgia Tech, as they would run all over Penn this day, as they would have two runners with over 100 yards and almost 300 yards by halftime. To go along with the crazy offense, their defense was even better this game, as they didn't give up a first down to Penn until the third quarter, and Penn didn't have 100 yards of total offense in this entire game. With all of this, Georgia Tech destroyed Penn, 41 to nothing, which shocked many in the Northeast who weren't ready for a non-Eastern team, especially a Southern team, to be this good. Georgia Tech continued their run of dominance throughout the rest of their season, only giving up 17 points the next six games, while their offense scored an average of 65 points per game. For this season, they would average 54 points, as well as average 320 yards of rushing per game, including having the leading rusher this season, Everett Strumper, have 1,150 yards of rushing, which was pretty insane to have a runner have over 1,000 yards. Georgia Tech would win their next five games in 1918, making this 1917 season part of a 31-game unbeaten streak. Well, there you have it. There are the best, oldest college football teams. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Again, make sure you like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Also, please make sure you leave me a comment. Just make sure you like the video as well. I'm really looking for comments. Uh, also, please tell me what videos you want me to do what teams do you think I'm missing? Just leave me a comment on anything. I really don't care. I just want to uh, see what your comments are. Also, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Sports Wronged. Plus, I'm going to be having a huge series of videos coming out in March, so stay tuned for that. And thank you so much for hanging out with me for Wrong Sports.